our, our next uh, speaker, um, Nikki White, Professor Nikki White from Cambridge, uh, who is our Lyle medalist. And <laughs> Nikki's going to talk about the hunt for red noise, scale, power, and color in the earth sciences. Uh, over to you, Nikki. Oh, Thank I you, Mr. Add, President. sorry, Nikki, just before you start, that anybody who would like to ask a question or, or table a question, we have, we will take it a question. Uh, it, you could go to Q&A on the uh, Zoom thing here at the bottom of the panel and just type in your question and we'll, uh, we'll bring it up at the end. Sorry, Nikki, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me and see the pointer? We can hear you and I can see the pointer. I've had the immense good fortune of working with a very large number of very clever PhD students. And it would be invidious to pick out any one of them, but I'm going to have to be invidious. So what I want to do is talk about the, I'd like to showcase the work that I've done with uh, three uh, former PhD students, Mark Hoggard, Gareth Roberts, and Katie Sheen. And um, the pieces of work may seem unrelated, but I'd like to persuade you that there is a, a thread that runs through all three and that all three have a big future. So, the first piece of work concerns uh, um, research on dynamic obser observable dynamic topography that Mark Hoggard and myself did. The second piece of work concerns work on fluvial drainage patterns with Gareth Roberts in Imperial. And the third and possibly most exciting piece of work is work that Katie Sheen did with myself and Colin Caulfield uh, at Cambridge. Now, uh, you're probably wondering, there are two things I'd like to say about the, the three pictures I just showed you. First is, it's very important to me and the three individuals that these pictures are all outside. The three uh, projects they were concerned with are about the observable Earth. And I think it's important in, to, in the geological society that what we do is look at the Earth, basically. The second thing about these slides is this is a peculiar uh, label in each case, k to the minus one, k to the minus two, and k to the minus five over three. Now that's part of the thread that runs through the talk. Now I, I have to remind you that k is the wave number. So think of k, k is two pi over lambda, it's the inverse of wavelength. So when I talk about big values of k, I'm talking about uh, very small wavelengths, small things, and very small values of k are very large wavelengths. Okay, let's start with the first topic, which concerns Mark Hoggard. And this is about how we observe dynamic topography in the earth. Dynamic topography is generated um, by flow within the viscous mantle. So we have density anomalies, either less dense objects or more, less, more dense objects within the mantle. And because the mantle has a finite viscosity, you get flow, either upward flow or downward flow, and that produces some fraction of the total topography of the Earth. It's only a fraction. And the name of the game is how do we interrogate the Earth's surface to extract this signal of dynamic topography? Now, the underpinning physics of all this uh, is to do with Stokes' flow, which I won't go into in detail, but uh, Stokes was a very clever applied mathematician who worked in Cambridge in the late 19th century. He was actually from County Sligo in Ireland. One of the consequences of Stokes' flow about density anomalies within the, the mantle is it means the geoid, which is the shape the Earth has if it was a fluid body, the shape of the geoid of the Earth is quite irregular. And um, so it's like a knobbly multicolored potato. And you can see major geoid depressions, such as that south of India, and a major geoid high centered uh, on, on Iceland. So that's the reason why the geoid is knobbly. It's because of this um, viscous flow within the deep earth. Uh, and of course, what's generating um, the knobbliness is essentially uh, lateral mass changes deep within the mantle, which we've become as a community much better at imaging using seismic tomography. So the central question for me is how do we measure or observe dynamic topography? There are plenty of predictions that are around and about. And the best place to start is in the oceanic realm. And that's because 
in the oceans, we have a very good rule about the way in which plates cool and thicken away from the mid-ocean ridge. So what I'm interested in is anomalies with respect to this cooling pattern, anomalies where you have either red ups or blue downs. Now, the way to get at these anomalies is through careful measurements of age depth in the oceans. The big problem, of course, in the oceans is you've got variable thicknesses of sediment and variable thicknesses of oceanic crust. So we rely on fantastic industry data like this line here from Ion. In some sense, these images from the ocean floor look a bit boring compared with some of the more exciting um, seismic reflection data that many of you are familiar with, but it's, it's really key for what we want to do. So you can see the seabed, you can see the sediment basement interface, and you can see the moho. And you can use these crisp uh, images to correct for the sediment thickness variation and for the crustal thickness variation and get at accurate measurements of residual depth anomalies, which we refer to as essentially a proxy of dynamic topography. So all these dead flies on this picture are, are measurements of age depth throughout the oceans. We have two and a half thousand here, and my current PhD student, Megan Holt, has a master data base of up to 10,000 points. The red line is average plate cooling behavior. So the anomalies we're interested in measuring are essentially the distance from a black dot, colored in red here, down to the, um, the plate cooling model, or indeed the other way around. So red is something that's anomalously above age depth cooling law, and blue is anomalously below. So you can think of it as dyna positive dynamic topography in one case and negative dynamic topography in the other case. So one of the things that Mark did in his PhD was assemble a large database of industry and academic data shown in blue and red respectively here. And these data enable us to construct uh, a dynamic topography map of the world. I could spend the rest of my 20 minutes just talking about this map, which contains lots of hidden treasures, but I'm afraid I must move on. So one of the things you can do then is, oh, uh, before I weave a spherical harmonic representation of it, I'd just like to mention at this point that I am a field geologist and indeed the way in which dynamic topography connects with things like uh, the geochemistry of basalts is something that's very dear to my heart right at the moment. So uh, field work is central to this discipline. So we can take um, our spot measurements of dynamic topography and weave a spherical harmonic representation up to spherical harmonic degree L of 31, which corresponds to a wavelength of about a thousand kilometers. Again, I could spend a lot of time talking about this map, but I'm going to press on. If you filter that map and just look at the longest wavelength component, which is about spherical harmonic degree two, which corresponds to wavelengths of 10,000 kilometers, you can see there's a sort of a lazy pattern. And what you're looking at is an amplitude um, of dynamic topography at these longest wavelengths of plus or minus 100 meters. Now the predictions of dynamic topography, which are built out of Stokes flow, these predictions generally look like the map I'm showing you here. So I want you to compare prediction with observation. Prediction, observation. The pattern over the globe is more or less the same, but the amplitude is completely different. The predictions mostly suggest that uh, dynamic topography at these long wavelengths has an amplitude of plus or minus two kilometers, and we're only actually seeing plus or minus 100 meters. That's summarized in this slide here. This is power on the y-axis as a function of degree, or if you prefer wavelength along the top, or if you prefer wave number, which you'll remember is two pi over lambda. Power is simply the amplitude of dynamic topography that we observe squared, that's all, just to get rid of the sign. The red line is the key line. The red is the observed spectrum of dynamic topography. And rather nicely, it obeys something called Cowler's rule, which is to do with the gravity of the earth that I don't have time to go into in more detail. Critically, the red observed spectrum for dynamic topography is very different to that of the predicted models shown in blue. It's very different to degree two, and it's very different at higher degree. So there's a fundamental mismatch between what the predictions say and what the observations say. And that's still um, something that 
the dynamic topographic community is trying to thrash out. Now, the last thing I want to say about that slope, the red slope, which obeys Cowler's rule, is that it follows k to the minus one, wave number to the minus one, which is referred to, and this uh, really come, this jargon comes from acoustic engineering, it's referred to as pink noise. Um, if you want to have satisfactory sleep at night, you should listen to pink noise, apparently, on your headphones. So, pink noise, if we look at the, this power spectral density uh, picture shown here, where frequency is essentially wave number, we can see that noise can be described as red noise, pink noise, white noise, or blue noise. Pink noise is k to the minus one. As you'll see later, red is k to the minus two. White uh, has the same power spectral density over all uh, wave numbers, so it's k to the zero. And blue noise, as we'll see later, is k to the power of one. So I, although I don't have to, time to go through the mathematical analysis, the reason why the scaling of observable dynamic topography is k to the minus one, or pink, is because of Stokes' viscous flow. Basically, deeper density anomalies, anomalies generate surface dynamic topography with smaller amplitudes. So as the density anomalies bury deeper and deeper in the mantle, it has a smaller effect on the Earth's surface. And that gives rise to this k to the minus one or, or pink noise, um, to use the jargon. That's the end of my piece concerning the work that I did in collaboration with Mark Hoggard. There is a great future in this work. We need to understand what is the bust between observed and predicted dynamic topography. And furthermore, how does observed dynamic topography vary through geological time over, say, the Phanerozoic? And um, that's going to take us the next 20 years to sort out. And really, it's rooted in stratigraphy. The second topic I want to talk about is work that Gareth Roberts and I initiated, which is really how fluvial landscapes may record things like dynamic topography as a function of space and time. And what triggered our interest was the fact that if you take a, a long wavelength free air gravity map of Africa, which you can regard as a proxy, a crude proxy for dynamic topography, you will notice that the drainage, certainly around the uplifted bits in red, like in Namibia that I'm pointing out here, you get nice radial drainage on these domes true in South Africa, true in the Hagar Massif as well. The blue depressed down, down wells in terms of dynamic topography have lazy sinuous drainage. So it looks as if the present day drainage pattern is moderated in some way by neogene dynamic topography. Now, Gareth and I wanted to go deeper. And the way we wanted to go deeper was to see the way in which the height of a river along the length of a river perhaps records uplift rate. Now, this is ostensibly a complex topic because there are a lot of things going on when you consider fluvial uh, erosion. So I'm not going to talk about the details. I'll just cut straight to what we think is the, 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 the primary driver. So what we did was take lots of rivers, lots of river profiles from Africa, and you can look at several thousand, and invert them or model them as a function of the uplift history of Africa. So what you're looking at in this movie is the uplift history of Africa that you, that, that you determine from many river profiles. It does a pretty good job at matching the actual uh, topography of Africa today. And that pretty good job is predicated on fitting many river profiles. So here are four sets of river profiles from four major catchments in Africa. And you can see how well the inverse model is able to fit the observations. So the red lines are our fits, theoretical fits, to the observed river profiles. And we can do a pretty good job. Now, why can we do such a good job? It, it seems as if there's, there's an emergent simplicity. Either that or we're doing something terribly wrong. So either there is some underlying simplicity in the seemingly complex um, physics that underpins fluvial drainage. And, and we think that's the, the, the issue at heart. And that's illustrated in this picture here. On the right, we have the river profile for the Niger. 
And on the left, we have the power spectrum. So it's the height of the river squared as a function of wave number. And you can see this has a pretty tidy slope. And the slope is k to the minus two. So you're looking at a red noise problem here. Most of the power resides at the longest wavelengths. So dominated by the longest wavelengths. Now, this is something that's familiar to all of you here. This slightly busy picture is meant to wake everybody up. And this is Brownian motion which is red noise. So it goes by K to the minus two. So you have the yellow pollen grain being buffered by the water molecules. And the physics of this was all worked out by Einstein. Uh, I'm not sure what, what else Robert Brown actually did, uh, but he certainly looks extremely um, satisfied. Um, he was a, a, both a pollen expert and a palynologist. Now, if you look at, if you stack many uh, river spectra together, and look at the average behavior, you, you can see the red, uh, the red slope here. It looks like k, k to the minus two, but it's not quite perfectly k to the minus two. So there's actually a change in slope at the dashed line. On one side, at the smallest wave numbers, the longest wavelengths, we have k to the minus two. So it's red noise, confusingly sometimes referred to as Brownian noise, but not to be confused with brown noise, which is something else. And this is where you have essentially self-similarity. So um, amplitude and wavelength scale together. And that's well known. Now, as you get to wavelengths of about 100 kilometers or less, there's a change in slope and it becomes pink, k to the minus one. I'm not going to bother explaining what this dreadful phrase means, and I'll blame it on Werner et al. A great paper, but quite a difficult paper. Um, that talks about what's going on in this uh, pink zone here. But why do you get a transition from red noise at very long wavelengths to pink noise at shorter wavelengths? So one way of making pink out of red is to take red and add it to blue. Um, blue noise is k to the plus one, and that equals pink noise. So the key bit is where is the blue coming in? Now, before I tell you about the blue, let me just show you, and, and, and this is a couple of, this is a still that comes from the gaming community. The gaming community are extremely interested in making landscapes that refresh quickly and efficiently. So if you're using a computer game with figures wandering around in it, it's very important that the landscape is efficient computationally. So you don't use real landscapes, you simply make landscapes. Now this landscape looks terrifically real. Don't worry about the clouds, they were added in later. It looks like the Louisian minus the heather, basically. Um, and what's the fascinating thing about this landscape created by de Carpentier is that it's basically five lines of computer code. So power or elevation squared is proportional to k to the minus two. So it's a red noise landscape and you can literally write five lines of code and you will generate this uh, complicated looking um, landscape. Now we need to add in the real world, there's an additional uh, ingredient, which is the how to pinkify, how to make pink noise out of red once you reach wavelengths of about hundred kilometers. So pointillism points the way forward. This is a picture that's been uh, rendered in terms of blue noise. So what I mean by that is that the largest amplitudes are for the smallest wavelengths. So it's k to the plus one, if you think about that. And the source of blue noise, and it might be to some extent white noise as well, but the source of blue noise in nature on river profiles is essentially all the stuff going on in terms of transport of boulders, waterfalls, the interaction of the biota, um, the, uh, uh, the fluids and the rock interface. So all the complexities, nonlinearities and shock behavior that we think kicks in once you reach a wavelength of about 100 kilometers. So the, the last thing to say there is that there's a lot of work still to be done to understand, we, we think fluvial landscapes are forced externally by things like dynamic topography varying through space and time, but obviously there are other complexities. So this is ongoing work as well. Now, the last topic I'd like to talk about is I think the most exciting and has the biggest future. And this is the work that Katie Sheen, who's now a senior lecturer in Exeter, 
uh, spearheaded with me, although other people in the USA actually came up with a bag of tricks. Now, seismic oceanography is really about taking seismic reflection technology, which we know and love in this community, and there have been many, many conferences in this room about this topic. Take this tried and trusted technology that we use to interrogate the solid earth and apply it to the water column in two dimensions, and in this case, three dimensions, where you can take state-of-the-art industry vessels with a flip-flop source shown in the two red dots, 10 streamers, and you're essentially collecting a swath, a three-dimensional swath of data um, through not just solid earth, but the water column as well. The importance of this is that physical oceanographers are a bit stuck. How the, their puzzle, their central puzzle, is how does one observe a global fluid on a sufficiently fine space and time scale? And this is the puzzle that was uh, essentially um, mooted by Walter Monk, who's the doyen of physical oceanography. He more or less invented uh, modern quantitative physical oceanography. I, reg I was lucky enough to meet Walter Monk several times, uh, and I... Uh, he he was still a keynote speaker at a at a conference I was at when he was 101. So I think I can regard myself as an early career scientist. And the the name of the game is to aim for the age unit of one monk, which is 101 years. Sadly, he died just before the plague started. So I'm going to first showcase a line, courtesy of Cathy Gunn, which is a line that crosses a major oceanic front in the South Atlantic. We're just off the River Plate here, Uruguay to the north, uh, Argentina to the south. Uh, the orange uh, stuff is the Brazil Current, which is warm salty water, which meets with um, Antarctic circumpolar water coming from the south, which is cold and fresh, and it meets at a major frontier. Uh, we are lucky enough to have access to a three-dimensional industry standard seismic reflection data set here that straddles the front. I'm just going to show you one image from that front in blue. And this, I think this is amazing, absolutely amazing. You're looking at a depth slice, uh, the seismic data at the top and a crude interpretation at the bottom. So you're looking at full depth in the water column down to the seabed, which is at about two kilometers depth. What you can see in the top image, I hope, is a major oceanic front that goes down to about two kilometers depth. Now, bear in mind that physical oceanographers, when they study fronts, look at the top 200 meters, typically. So this is the, the, the best imaged, uh, most deeply penetrating oceanic front in the world. Note that it's multi-stranded as you come near the surface, and it's got various large eddy structures associated with it, which are fascinating, and I don't have time to talk about in detail. On the Brazil current side, where the water is warm and salty, you get slightly boring looking horizontal stratification, the other side, which is the cold, fresh Antarctic circumpolar component, looks like a gigantic washing machine, basically. These images, don't forget we have 3D control. These have the potential to yield very par powerful new insights into how thermohaline circulation works. That's a bit of washing machine zoomed in for you. Now, the central question in physical oceanography, the thing that makes them get up in the morning, concerns ocean mixing. In the oceans, you get ubiquitous internal waves, which are generated by the action of the earth tides across rough bathymetry. So there are internal waves everywhere, and I'll show you a picture of some in a minute. The name of the game is that these internal waves generate mixing or turbulence in the oceans by what's known as the cascade of energy. So the breaking up of the internal waves, which break up in the sense of Shear causes them to overturn and lead to turbulent mixing. That's the paradigm within the physical oceanographic community. The question is how to measure um, this mixing. So first of all, I'll just show you some spectacularly imaged internal waves from some of our uh, seismic data. By the way, I omitted to say that these images are made by reprocessing um, 2 and 3D seismic reflection data. And the most important, important part of the processing sequence is very careful picking of the RMS velocities. So you can see beautiful internal waves here, these sinusoidal oscillations. Critically, you've got fleas on fleas. So you can see that they're little teeny weeny 
internal waves, which are superimposed on larger internal waves. They look almost, in Ken McCaffrey's world, like verging folds to some extent. So one of the things you can do is you can um, auto track these reflections and not just in the smooth way shown by the black line here, but you can actually uh, get lots of the up and down movement around all the little parasitic uh, internal waves through here. If you auto track these images, you can then make a power spectrum. So here's an average power spectrum, which summarizes an entire seismic image. We're looking at normalized power, which is the amplitude of all those internal waves of different sizes squared as a function of wave number or two pi over wavelength. You will notice on this summary, which is built up by stacking lots of power spectra together, uh, you can see there's a break in slope. One side is k to the minus five over two, which is almost red, almost k to the minus two. This side is known as the Garrett-Monk spectrum, and it's characteristic of internal waves all over the world. The other side has a very different slope. It's actually k to the minus five over three, which is slightly pinkish. That's why I've made it slightly reddy pink in color here. And it's k to the minus five over three. You're probably thinking k to the minus five over three is a very weird number. Uh, where did that come from? And I'll explain that in a minute. Bear in mind that this plot has been bent, so it's been um, it's been transformed to exaggerate the change in slope. Um, but these are the actual slopes. So where does k to the minus five over three come from? Well, in 1941, Andrei Kolmogorov who was working in Moscow, published a really important paper on uh, three-dimensional isotropic turbulence. He showed theoretically through dimensional analysis that uh, many of you will have heard of, and um, he showed by dimensional analysis that 3D isotropic turbulence should go by K or wave number to the power of minus five over three. Now, this may be a ratio that many of you are not familiar with, but if you mention this ratio to fluid dynamics, they go weak at the knees and their eyes begin to swim because they know exactly what that means. So what it means is there's a regime in here, which is K to the minus five over three, and it's characteristic of isotropic turbulence. So you get big, bigger whirls turning, breaking down into medium-sized whirls, breaking down into smaller and smaller whirls, until eventually, when you reach the length scale known as the Kolmogorov length scale, you break down and you get viscous dissipation. So this, this work of Kolmogorov builds on the original pioneering work of Lewis Fry Richardson, after whom the Richardson number that some of you are familiar with uh, is named. So big whirls, you get this cascading down through the energy. What is stunning is we're able to see an image, k to the minus five over three, from seismic data, which I think is mind blowing. When we first showed, when Katie and I first showed these results to an eminent physical oceanographer in, in Southampton National Oceanographic Center, he literally fell off his chair. So in summary, what the internal waves are doing is they start off having a slope at long wavelengths or small wave numbers, which is the Garrett-Monk spectrum, k to the minus five over two. And at, at a certain, uh, position at a certain wavelength, you start to get breakdown and you start to get isotropic turbulence. Um, it's, the story is a little bit more complicated than that, but I don't have time to go into the details here. This plot, by the way, is an unbent plot. The major question that remains, which I'll end with, is how do internal waves actually break down? So we can see spectacular images on seismic data of internal waves which look like these beautiful sinusoidal oscillations. But what is the actual breakdown mechanism? The clue to this is in the sky. Now the sky is kind of the same, the atmosphere is, is similar. And this well-known artist was faithfully recording what he saw, which is of course these billows here. And these billows, which you can see in the sky today, uh, more or less any day, but not always as beautifully as this, these are Kelvin Helmholtz billows or Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. So they're formed when you have a, a less dense layer on top of a more dense layer and you apply shear. And they're essentially the way in which things like internal waves can break down to form turbulence. And this is a cartoon from uh, Stephen Thorpe, who's a, a well-known um, 
applied mathematician who's worked on physical oceanographic problems. So you apply the shear, as you can see in the top picture, and you make what look like folds. Um, um, and these folds overturn and form billows. And you actually get little eyes, these, these little, little bits here, these are known, Kelvin called these cat's eyes, and they're actually vortical nodes. So the amazing thing is you can see this on seismic reflection images of the water column. Here's a beautiful billow forming with a superb vortical node in blue in the middle. So this is developing asymmetry. Here's another one, which is a classic uh, Kelvin Helmholtz billow and a proto vortical node growing in the middle. And then finally, you can see a sort of baby one beginning up at the top here uh, and a rather beautiful one forming down here. So the seismic reflection images that we're beginning to make in 2D, 3D and indeed 4D from the uh, oceans, I think will enable us to unlock things that physical oceanographers have hitherto only dreamt of. The final image I have is, this is a really lovely, large billow, which I'll colour in for you like that. So I'll just end by saying, I think Walter Monk uh, would have loved this, really. Um, and by the way, the answer to his mixing, he wrote a classic paper called Abyssal Recipes in 1966. And the answer to mixing is, of course, one, nice simple answer. He was devastated when SI units were introduced because one centimeter squared per second, which is what he thought the diffusivity in the oceans was, became unfortunately 10 to the minus four meters squared per second. And he didn't really like that because it's nice to have an answer that's just one. Uh, there is huge future, I think, in this last topic. And there I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, each each of those could have been half an hour, and uh, and, and we would still be fascinated. Um, I can't help but ch just to ask about the, f the first the first one. Uh, it's a, it's, well, I, hopefully, it's the question Ken would ask as well. Maybe uh, in in that uh, your modelling of 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 those large um, wavelength features. You appear to be using the Earth's surface or the lithosphere as an isotropic thing, rather than the gnarly, broken, complex uh, sort of mishmash of, of, of heterogeneity and, and, and uh, inconsistencies. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you explain that sort of smoothness with, with that complexity? And, and, and how do you deal with it? What we've tried to do, so first of all, I'd say there's an awful lot still to be done. We've only begun. What we've tried to do so far is we focused a lot, as you know, on the ocean, on the oceanic part, where the gnarliness, as you call it, of the plate, is it, it's right. a bit less gnarly because we, we, we got the powerful cooling and thickening law. Now, it's, it's gnarly at some level, but I think we're seeing a very strong signal of, of dynamic topography, dynamic ups and downs in the oceans that is get atable. And that's been a good place to start. Now, the, what you're really asking me about is the continents. Mm. Fortunately, so far, because we're looking at what you might call a low degree spherical harmonic problem, where we're looking at degrees several of naught up to say 30, which is about a thousand kilometers, you can actually have large blank bits in the continents and get away with murder in that sense, you can still build a spherical harmonic model if you chop out all the cratons, for example. In the non-cratonic regions, you can play a similar game to the game we played in the oceans, but you do have to hold your nose a bit. So you, I think we're beginning to get there. So the biggest wrinkle, the biggest gnarliness in the continents is variable crustal thickness and density, which is get atable. Now, the other gnarly bit, of course, is what the lithospheric mantle is doing in terms of thickness and density. And I, I think I didn't have time to talk about that here, but it is something you and I can discuss in the future. And, and, and that's really where we, the direction we want to go in, in, in now. So 
there isn't really an answer to your question, except that there's still an awful lot to do. What is clear, the, the biggest lesson of what I talked about is it's in, in this society, we've been led astray. I'm a geologist, you're a geologist. We've been led astray historically by theoretical physicists. And there are many called celebras. And I think dynamic topography is another called celebra where the theoreticians were hard at this for 30 years. And these are people who never look at rocks. The answer is in the field, as always. And we've always known that as a society. Absolutely. Well, that's a great place to end your uh, contribution there, Nikki. So thank you very much. Uh, and now we move on to the last uh, event of the day. 